My name is Dion Rossiter, and I am the executive director of a group called Science at Cal on campus. And we are excited to be joining by two of our esteemed scientists at both UC Berkeley and Berkeley Lab on understanding the nature of dark energy, our first midday science cafe of the year. So welcome back, everyone. We have two upcoming midday science cafes. So write those, those dates down, save those dates, and we look forward to seeing you there. I'm gonna start with just a, a quick land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge and we recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. Every member of the UC Berkeley community and the larger Berkeley community, excuse me, has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So a little bit more about science at Cal. We bring the beauty and the benefits of UC Berkeley research to the public through public programs, science cafes, lectures, festivals, so much more. Of course, this pandemic has brought us all inside. And so we are not joining you in any live events, but we have our beautiful virtual events that we continue to host. We have a about one a week. So join us. You can join our mailing list um, by visiting us at science at cal.berkeley.edu and sign up there. Um, you can email us and learn more about our programs there. And we're, of course, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. Um, before I hand things over to Berkeley Lab, I'll just give a quick reminder of we'll be having two talk or two presentations, as you know, with two different scientists. And in between those presentations, we will be uh, hosting a short Q&A. So you can go ahead and make sure you're continuing continuously adding your questions to the question box, the chat box, and we'll go ahead and share those questions with our presenters. Um, we will also bring everyone back together at the end and do a presentation, a Q&A with everyone together. Um, I also want to say this recording will, this uh, presentation will be recorded as normal, and we will share with everyone after the event, and it will also live in our, on our YouTube page. So I'm going to now hand it over to Berkeley Labs with Jen Chang. So welcome, Jen. Thanks, Dee. Uh, as Dee mentioned, my name is Jen Tang, and I'm the Director for Federal and Community Relations at Berkeley Lab. And to start, I want to give you a little bit of context. Uh, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 U.S. Department of Energy national laboratories across the country, and we're supported by DOE's Office of Science and are managed by the University of California. All of the research we conduct at the lab is unclassified. Since our founding in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab has been dedicated to achieving this, uh, excuse me, to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. And for those doing the math, this year actually marks the lab's 90th birthday. And as we celebrate our past achievements and imagine what discoveries uh, over the next 90 years might bring, we hope you'll visit our 90th anniversary webpage, which is berkeleylabnext90.lbl.gov, uh, which features many opportunities to engage with us, including a lunchtime lecture next Friday, highlighting how lab researchers are contributing to the fight against COVID-19 and helping keep the nation safe. Uh, so fast forward 90 years from 1931, today, Berkeley Lab researchers develop sustainable energy and environmental solutions. Uh, we create useful new materials. We advance the frontiers of computing and probe the mysteries of life, matter, and the universe, which you'll hear a little bit more about later today. Our main campus is nestled in the Berkeley Hills, north of UC Berkeley, and we employ about 4,000 people, about 1,700 of whom are scientists, engineers, and faculty members. More than 500 of our employees are undergraduate and graduate students. These are scientists who are just beginning their research journey. 
Now, Berkeley Lab's proximity to Cal and our close ties to the UC system create a really unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. A number of the lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses as either students, postdocs, or professors with joint appointments at the lab. So as you can imagine, Berkeley Lab's relationship with UC Berkeley is especially close, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across many frontiers. One of the main motivations for our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary research from both of our institutions, and we hope you enjoy today's presentation on dark energy. With that, Dee, let me turn it back to you. Thank you, Jen. I'm going to stop sharing and I am going to invite Emmanuel Sean up to up to the podium that is virtual. Um, Emmanuel is a researcher in astrophysics at the Berkeley National Lab. As a cosmologist, he studies the composition and history of the universe by analyzing data from large telescopes in the United States, Chile, and space. His goal is to learn about the nature of dark matter, dark energy, and the masses of neutrinos by using the universe as a laboratory. Sounds fancy. His work focuses on the cosmic microwave background, the earliest light visible after the Big Bang, and the large scale distribution of galaxies. Emmanuel grew up in Paris, France, before he moved to Princeton, New Jersey and Berkeley, California. He loves sailing, tinkering, electronics and DIY projects. Besides being a techni technically a professional astrophysicist, he is also an aspir aspiring amateur astronomer aren't we all? Um, he has said that I can call him Manu, so that's what I will be calling him for the rest of the presentation. Um, so take it away, Manu. Great, thank you very much, Dee, for this uh, introduction and thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to tell you about uh, dark energy, which is one of the most important open problems in all the fundamental physics and what we can learn about dark energy from gravitational lensing which is the way that uh, galaxies on the other side of the universe have found to smile at us. Now, if you don't know what dark energy or gravitational lensing are, please uh, do not be alarmed. You have come to the exact right place. Uh, this is what uh, Claire and I will be uh, talking about today. So um, let's get started. And first, uh, what is this dark energy? What do astronomers mean uh, when they talk about dark energy? Um, to answer this question, it helps to uh, take a bit of distance and perspective. So if you, if you start from down here on Earth and you look up at night, you might see this bright band of stars across the sky. And this is the Milky Way, our own galaxy. If you could uh, escape from our galaxy and look at it from the outside, um, it might look something like this. So this is not the Milky Way. This is another galaxy seen by the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, but a galaxy that is thought to look very similar to our Milky Way a beautiful uh, spiral galaxy with a bar at the center. And if you keep zooming out, if you keep looking on larger and larger scales, uh, what you'll see is that uh, a galaxy like the Milky Way is nothing but one tiny island in a vast ocean of many, many, many more galaxies. Um, so in this image from the Hubble Space Telescope, pretty much every blob or colorful speck of light that you see is an individual galaxy just like the Milky Way. Um, in fact, in the portion of the universe that we're able to observe from our vantage point, uh, it is estimated that there are as many as 100 uh, billion galaxies, so many, many galaxies. So um, an image like this uh, looks pretty and gives context about um, the scales we're thinking about. Uh, but as a physicist, uh, the question that, um, that you, you want to ask is how does this system of 100 billion galaxies evolve? Um, how do these galaxies move? What is the dynamics of this system? And uh, to think about this problem, it helps to uh, simplify it into really the simplest possible physical model where you replace every one of these galaxies by basically just a dot or a sphere or a ball. The ones that are closer to you appear larger and the ones that are further away appear smaller. And so now the, the problem we're talking about is how does this system of 100 billion balls uh, evolves in time, how are all these balls moving? Now, uh, observational astronomers have uh, given an answer to that question. Uh, they have demonstrated that the universe is in expansion, the universe is expanding. And what that looks like in this model is the following. Uh, each of these individual galaxies 
is actually moving away from all the others. Uh, and in this simulation, as they move away, they appear smaller and smaller. So if I play it again, this is what the expansion of the universe uh, looks like. So that's good. Uh, the universe is doing just that right now. The galaxies are expanding. And um, as a physicist, uh, we'd like to predict uh, outcomes. And so we'd like to, to ask um, what is going to happen next? Uh, is this expansion going to continue? Is it going to stop? Is it going to go faster or slower? And um, to answer this question, um, we are in very familiar uh, territory as a physicist. This is the mechanics of 100 billion spheres uh, who feel the effect of gravity uh, from each other. This is also familiar territory for a lot of people. Um, here, the problem is basically how can we juggle uh, 100 billion balls? And uh, most of us know how to juggle one ball. And it turns out, um, if you know how to juggle one ball, uh, juggling 100 billion is very similar. And so there are two possible outcomes. So you think of uh, all these balls being uh, thrown out into open space. And uh, the first outcome we probably think about is the following. Um, the balls slow down, turn around, and then falls back down. So this is the scenario where uh, the universe's expansion slows down, turns around, and finally the universe collapses. So this would look something like this, where the universe expands, slows down, turns around, and collapses, a rather painful outcome. The second possibility, uh, which you might uh, also think about, is um, if I'm able to throw this ball fast enough, something like 10 kilometers per second, uh, that ball will escape the Earth gravity, uh, never to come back. And so this is a case where um, the expansion would keep going forever. However, because gravity is pulling on, on that ball or pulling on all of these galaxies, the expansion has to slow down. So this might look like this, where all the galaxies are moving away from each other forever, farther and farther, but ever more slowly. So these are the, the two possible outcomes if only gravity as we know it is at play. And um, the key thing uh, to remember is that uh, whatever the outcome, the expansion must slow down. And intuitively, uh, this makes sense because as those, these are, those spheres are moving away from each other, uh, gravity is always pulling back on them, uh, making them slow down. So uh, this is the prediction. Uh, now let me show you what uh, observers have actually found. And what observers have found looks something like this. Um, and so the expansion does not um, turn around and uh, turn into a collapse. The expansion keeps going forever. But if you look at it carefully, you might notice that this expansion is actually accelerated. So it's not slowed down as we expected, it's accelerated. And um, this accelerated expansion um, is very shocking because gravity alone cannot explain it. And if you think about it, it's the same as if you threw this, this ball in the air and um, not only did it escape forever, um, but it, it started moving faster and faster. Um, so if you saw that, you would have to assume that there is some sort of energy, uh, maybe a little rocket inside the ball, maybe a draft of air, some energy to power that acceleration. Um, if you have an acceleration, you have to have force. And uh, this is exactly what uh, we refer to when we talk about dark energy. Um, so this, this one slide is probably the most important in this whole uh, presentation. And if you remember one thing, it should be this. Um, the expansion of the universe is found to be accelerated. This is impossible if gravity as we know it um, is the only force acting here. And therefore, we must assume that there is some unknown source of energy that powers uh, this acceleration. And this is what we call uh, dark energy. OK, so um, this does not really answer the question, what is dark energy? It just tells you what we refer to when we talk about a dark energy. And so um, what is it? Is it a small rocket inside of galaxies? Is this uh, a powerful draft of air? And uh, the short answer is we do not currently know. Uh, we have a number of good guesses, and uh, Claire will tell us about them in a minute. And so in order to make progress on this question, we ask a slightly simpler question. Um, what are the properties that we can observe of this dark energy? How much is there? Does the amount of dark energy change with time, uh, etc.? And to observe uh, these properties of dark energy, uh, we need to remember what dark energy does. So dark energy causes the acceleration in the expansion of the universe. And so the distances between galaxy, galaxies increases at an ever faster rate. So if you want to know how much dark energy is, you can measure the distances between galaxies. Another effect of dark energy, which I did not describe, is as the universe expands, uh, the clumpiness, the way that galaxies are clumped together, uh, is reduced. And so if you, uh, if you can measure the clumpiness of this matter in the universe, you can learn about the amount of dark energy. 
And so in practice, uh, to measure this, uh, the acceleration of the expansion, the clumpiness of matter, um, there are many, many different uh, methods. Um, perhaps the most natural is to survey galaxies. So um, take a telescope and look at the positions of as many galaxies as you can to measure their distances and their clumpiness. Um, and Claire, in a moment, will tell us about an impressive new experiment uh, that does justice. Um, but in some cases, um, some of these galaxies you may not be able to see, uh, maybe because they are too faint. Um, and so when you have matter that you're not able uh, to see, um, you're not able to just survey the galaxies. And this is where gravitational lensing comes in. So I'm now going to explain what gravitational lensing is, but you should think of it as a way uh, to detect galaxies that are too faint to see or matter that would otherwise be invisible. So um, let's talk about gravitational lensing. To understand gravitational lensing, uh, you need to understand a bit of general relativity. Uh, fortunately, that can be done in two sentences. Um, so if we go back to our system of the galaxy or this massive sphere somewhere in space-time, what general relativity tells us is that mass grips space-time, telling it how to curve. And in return, space-time grips mass, telling it how to move. This means that if you had a particle that would normally move in a straight line, in the absence of the curvature of space-time, the path of this particle is now deflected. And the important thing here is that this effect of uh, deflection of particles by a, a massive object like this galaxy uh, also works on light. And uh, the reason this is important is that this galaxy here may be too faint for you to see, or the matter there may be invisible for any reason. And all you might be able to see is this deflection of light. But if you see this deflection of light, you know exactly that there had to be a matter uh, galaxy or a massive object here, and you know how massive it is. So gravitational lensing, this deflection of light by massive objects, really is a way to see mass that would be invisible uh, in any other way. OK, so that's the theory of gravitational lensing. What does it look like uh, in practice? Uh, it turns out you can simulate it as, at home. So here, what you see is an image of uh, galaxies. Every blob here is a galaxy. And I placed a fake um, red round galaxy right at the center. And if you want to simulate the effect of gravitational lensing, all you need uh, is basically a glass of wine. Uh, so you need to empty the glass. That helps for a number of reasons. And uh, use the foot of the glass. It turns out that the way the foot of this glass distorts images is very similar to what uh, a massive galaxy would do to a background image. And so if you slide uh, your glass in front of this image, um, you will see that uh, this red galaxy gets stretched. And at some point, multiple images the multiple images appear and disappear. And these are uh, distortions uh, you can clearly detect in these images of galaxies. And so even though uh, the mass causing the lensing or the glass of wine may be invisible because it's transparent, you know it is there because of the distortions it causes on the images of galaxies. So this uh, image I showed here at, this, at the start might make a bit uh, more sense. Those multiple blue dots you see here in those streaks are nothing but distorted images of background blue galaxies due to the mass of those bright yellow uh, massive galaxies. So this is a gravitational lensing. And now is a really exciting time uh, to measure this effect because a number of experiments are underway uh, to really revolutionize our data on this. Uh, one very important one is the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, which is about to start observing about a billion uh, galaxy images to measure this lensing. To do this, you need a very large and fast optics uh, in your telescope and uh, the largest digital camera in the world. Uh, your cell phone might have a few million pixels. This one has 3.2 billion. And there are other um, experiments that I'm also very excited about uh, to measure a slightly different sort of lensing. Um, these are called Simons Observatory and Cosmic Microwave Background Stage 4, um, also in Chile. So here's an image of the collaboration of one of these uh, experiments. And um, these people have been, uh, we've all been trying to deal with COVID in different ways, uh, whether by improving our sourdough skills or getting slowly uh, taken over by plants. And um, what I want to uh, leave you with is that uh, those measurements of lensing from these experiments are going to revolutionize what we understand about dark energy and help us make progress in this most important question. Um, so thank you everyone uh, for your attention. And I'll just flash the summary of things um, I would like you to take away from this talk. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So we'll just be taking some questions from the audience. As I've been reminding folks, you can add them to the Q&A um, box or you can add them to the chat, either is fine. Um, but why don't we just start with, I know you described in really, really great detail and definitely understand what gravitational lensing is. Why is it called lensing? Right. Um, the reason it's called lensing, it's because um, those massive objects um, that you might have here, those massive galaxies in the universe uh, deflect lights. And this is exactly uh, what a traditional lens does. Uh, my glasses, or this glass of wine um, deflects light. But the analogy goes a little bit further. Um, so in the same way as the lens in my glasses or in a telescope um, allow you to see um, smaller objects with a higher resolution or gather more light, uh, this gravitational lensing does the same. Um, in some cases, um, if the alignment is correct, um, what gravitational lensing does is it magnifies the image of the background galaxy that it distorts. So if you remember that, that red galaxy dot, uh, in some cases that red dot gets enhanced. And uh, this allows you to detect fainter objects that you would not otherwise be able to see. And so in a sense, those gravitational lenses are like a, a telescope that nature has put there for free. And we just need to look through um, to see objects that we couldn't otherwise see. Great, thank you. So can you say a little bit more, more about the um, Vera Rubin Observatory or the Simons Observatory? Right, um, yes. Um, so the Vera Rubin Observatory um, is about to take first light maybe in a year or so. Um, here you can see uh, the building uh, being built um, in Chile. And uh, basically the dome is now constructed enough that um, people can work on the optics inside. Um, and this telescope, um, as I tried to say, uh, basically has faster optics than most other telescopes. And what that lets it do is observe very uh, wide swaths of the sky uh, very fast. And so um, this uh, instrument will really uh, revolutionize our ability to measure lensing by measuring more uh, fainter galaxies. Um, these other experiments that I talked about, uh, Simon's Observatory and Cosmic Microwave Background Stage 4, um, I said that they were looking at a slightly different sort of lensing. Um, and in fact, this sort of lensing is called uh, lensing of the cosmic microwave background. And so here the principle is the same. Um, you're still learning about uh, the lens, the massive object, by looking at distortions of background images. But the background image is no longer an image of galaxies. It is this cosmic microwave background, which could be the object of uh, a whole talk. And it's basically the baby picture uh, of the universe, the first light we see from the Big Bang. Wonderful, thank you. So let's go ahead and hand things over to Jen and Claire now. Thanks both. And Manu, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Claire Poppett. And Claire is an astrophysics researcher at UC Berkeley's Space Sciences Laboratory. Now, Claire specializes in astronomical instrumentation. These are the tools that are used to observe objects and phenomena that occur in space. And she's particularly motivated to research and develop new technical solutions that are necessary to build the next generation of astronomical instruments. So after Claire received her PhD from Durham University in England in 2011, she moved to Berkeley where she's been ever since. And in her spare time, Claire enjoys hiking, climbing and any other activity that involves being outside, especially when it includes being with her two young children. Claire, let me turn it over to you to start your presentation. Thank you, Jen. Okay, you should see my screen. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, my name is Claire Poppet. I'm from UC Berkeley Space Sciences Lab. Um, today I'm going to talk about the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, or DESI, uh, which is a new 3D cosmic map um, to study dark energy. Now, Manu gave us a great introduction um, about, oh, about dark energy. Um, I don't have a ball to juggle, uh, but I want to show you kind of a different way to interpret why we care so much um, about dark energy. And in this plot, I'm showing you different possibilities um, for the fate of the universe. We have time on the x-axis and size of the universe on the y-axis. 
and we have mathematical models that describe the growth of the universe. Um, but the answer that they give is very different depending upon the exact quantities of dark energy and dark matter that we put into those models of our universe. And so the orange line at the bottom um, shows a universe in which there is a large amount of dark matter and no dark energy. And so in this model, the universe holds enough matter that the combined gravitational attraction of everything will gradually stop this expansion. And then over time, um, it will collapse. And so this is what we call the big crunch. Um, the blue and the green line are also models where we have no dark energy and slightly less dark matter. Um, and in these models, the universe continues expanding forever at a constant rate. Now, in the 1990s, this was our understanding of the universe. And it wasn't until uh, 1998 when Hubble came along and took some images of some very distant supernovae uh, that we had any idea that this might not be the case, um, hence the Nobel Prize uh, that was recently received. So if we include um, dark energy into our model, this red line, where we have uh, some amount of dark energy and some amount of dark matter, and we have an expansion of the universe that accelerates, uh, eventually ending in a big freeze. So if we have some amount of dark matter and dark energy, what exactly, um, what exactly is our universe made of? Um, and so it turns out the things that we can see, which are stars and dust, only make up about 5% of the universe. And dark energy accounts for a massive 70%. Um, and one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, what is dark energy? Uh, the answer is that we really don't know. Uh, so we have this thing that makes up 70% of our universe, and we don't really know what it is, uh, which is a problem. Um, we have some ideas, but we need to make measurements of the universe at greater precision in order to be able to answer that question more confidently. And that's what we're trying to do. So what will DESI do? Uh, DESI will measure the effect of dark energy on the expansion of the universe. And how will it do it? It will obtain optical spectra, which just means studying light, for tens of millions of galaxies and quasars in order to construct a 3D map spanning the nearby universe to 11 billion light years. So uh, dark energy is the name that we give to the phenomena causing the acceleration of the universe. We can't directly measure it uh, since we can't see it and it doesn't have a gravitational pull. Um, and we have a lot of ideas for possibilities of what it could be. Um, is it some property of space? Is it a new dynamic fluid? Is it a new theory of gravity? Um, and the thing that we need to decide between these dark energy possibilities is more data and better data. And um, Manu talked about using gravitational lensing to understand dark energy. I'm going to talk about a different technique, uh, which is using galaxy surveys. Um, and so a galaxy survey just means taking data from lots of galaxies. And the early universe was a dense fluid where growth of overdense regions sent sound waves rippling outwards. And as the universe expanded, the density got too low for these ripples to propagate anymore. And so they got frozen into the distribution of galaxies. And so much like the ripples on a pond where you can learn things about the pond by studying the ripples, if we also look for ripples in the clustering of galaxies, we can learn things about our universe. And so moving on from this simple picture of a pond, let's translate that to what those, those ripples look like in our universe. So here's a graphic where if we took a slice through the universe, this one is at 3.8 billion years ago, um, and we look for all of the galaxies that are that exact age. What we then do is we say, what is the average separation between galaxies? So if this white dot at the center um, was one galaxy, the white circle around it is the average distance, statistically speaking, that the next galaxy would be. And so that gives us a ruler at one age of the separation between galaxies. If we take another slice through the universe, five billion years ago and do the exact same thing, say what's the separation between these galaxies at this age, we get a second measurement um, of this length scale. And it turns out this length scale traces all the way back um, to the cosmic microwave background. Uh, so this is a st 
statistical measurement, um, meaning that we need to measure the location of, of many galaxies. The more galaxies we have, the better statistics that we have. And the plan with DESI is to measure the age of 35 million galaxies. Now, 35 million galaxies does sound like a lot, um, but we are actually on the trend line for survey size. Uh, so in this plot, I'm showing you um, year of first light of an instrument on the x-axis and the number of observations that that instrument made um, on the y-axis. So you can see in 1990, these um, galaxy surveys, they reached about a thousand galaxies. And then as we increase in time of this red trend line, each survey delivered um, observations from more and more galaxies. So you can see DESI um, at the bottom of this blue arrow um, in the first year, we get data from a few million galaxies. By the end of our fifth year, we're on target um, to get observations from all of the 35 million galaxies that we aim for. Um, and maybe you might notice as well, there's a instrument already proposed that'll be even bigger than DESI to be on sky in uh, 2030 something. Um, we can talk more about future instruments uh, in the questions later if we need to. So how will we measure the light of all of these galaxies? One option would be to get a bigger telescope. If we have a bigger telescope, uh, we get more light and that means that we can see fainter objects. Another option would be more multiplexing. Uh, multiplexing means a number of, number of objects that we can get in a single observation. Another option would be to get better detectors with lower signal to noise. Uh, this means that we have um, better efficiency and also that means that we can see fainter objects. Now the strategy that we decided to take with DESI was to get more multiplexing. And for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to walk you through our instrument and describe how each of our design choices were critical to being able to achieve our goal of measuring 35 million objects. So step one in measure 35 million galaxies is to find your own telescope. Now, most, ob most observatories have multiple types of instruments that enable different types of science. Um, astronomers then apply for time on the telescope to make whatever observations they want to make to study whatever kind of science they're uh, researching. Now with DESI, we want to have every single second of observable science on the telescope in order to get as many targets as possible. So we found a telescope that wasn't being used in that way by multiple observers, and we took it over. And the telescope that we chose is the um, male telescope. This is a telescope on top of um, Kitt Peak Observatory, about 50 miles southwest of Tucson in Arizona. If we look inside of that dome that I'm pointing to, we can see the telescope. This is the, um, the four meter male telescope on Kitt Peak. It received first light in um, 1973. And at the time, it was the second largest telescope um, in the world. There's a few reasons that we like this telescope. Uh, first of all, it, it wasn't being used, so we could use it. Um, but also, it's a big, strong, solid telescope. The moving weight of the telescope is 150 kilotons, which is about the weight of um, eight African elephants. Um, so this telescope was able to hold the instrument that we needed um, that's very complex and I'm going to describe um, as it moved around the sky. For people not familiar with looking at big telescopes, the four meter mirror is here, um, four meter diameter, um, that gives you some idea of the scale. So we have our own telescope. Um, the next thing that we need to do is to give it a big field of view. Now I mentioned that the male has a four meter mirror, which is big, um, but it's essentially just a light bucket. And the real power of the instrument is in the lens system that we install. Now Desi uses six huge one meter lenses. Here's an image of one of them. Um, in order to deliver pristine images over a large area of the sky. And the area of the sky that we are able to observe in one pointing is 3.2 degrees in diameter. And what that means is if you were looking at the moon, you'd be able to fit um, six moon diameters across our focal plane. We can see a huge patch of the sky in one go. Um, here's a quick movie um, to give you another idea of scale. Uh, this is during um, the installation of DESI and uh, I think it's 2018 of this um, lens system being installed on the top of the telescope. Uh, this black barrel is what houses um, those six lenses. 
and it's being lifted up and placed into position. Um, and another cool thing about the corrector, uh, this lens system is not only its ability to see a huge patch of the sky at a single time, um, but it's also able to deliver a pristine image quality over a large area of the sky. So our observations um, take us really close to the horizon. Um, and just like how the sky changes color at sunset, we see the same effect when we point low down, which is uh, called chromatic aberration. And to overcome this, uh, we have two special lenses in that six lens design that spin against each other and correct this chromatic aberration. So we've got our telescope, we've got a big field of view. Um, our next task is to capture as many objects as possible. Uh, this is a, um, a photo of the focal plane of DESI. Um, and we capture the light from our galaxies in optical fibers. And an optical fiber is a tiny strand of glass, about 100 microns in diameter, which is about the diameter of a piece of hair. Um, so we're getting light from an entire galaxy down a strand of glass the size of your hair. And that's why we need the lens system to be so powerful. And so and then to get the light into the fiber, we need to position it with higher, a high accuracy. And this focal plane has 500 individual robots, each holding those fibers. Here is a movie of those positions moving. Uh, the blue dot is the optical fiber back illuminated. And you can see each of the, those little robots moving onto their, um, onto their target position. It takes about three minutes to position all 5,000 robots in order for us to be able to observe. And if you do some math, if we have about 10 hours of observations um, in an evening when it's dark, that's about 33 observations per night. If we have 5,000 fibers, that means those 33 observations could catch 165, 100,000 objects in a single night. That's how we increase our numbers so quickly. So we have our light and now we need to understand it. Uh, and we call this um, reading the fingerprint. And the oxygen doublet is one part of the fingerprint that we can read. And so on this plot, we have wavelength on the x-axis against flux on the y-axis, which, which is just counts. And this is light from one single galaxy that's gone through our instrument, down through the fibers, and onto our camera. Uh, and so normally, the oxygen doublet is green light. It's about 500 nanometers. Um, but because this galaxy is moving away from us, that light moves into the red. So you can see it here at uh, 6,700 ish um, angstroms. And so by looking for those two peaks at just the right separation, we know that that is um, the oxygen line. And by seeing how far it shifts away from 500 nanometers, we know how old it is. And to go back to this earlier graphic that I showed you, that's how we place those objects um, into the bins of their age. That's how we know exactly how old they are. So we know how to compare it to the other galaxies uh, and figure out how old they are. Uh, here's a photo of the, um, the instrument that takes those measurements. Uh, this is me, the last time I went to the telescope uh, right before the pandemic. This is the spectrograph shack. Uh, this is a set of um, 10 powerful um, spectrographs with uh, cameras on the back to obtain those spectras. So this is 2019 before the pandemic hit. We're still able to work since that happened, just in a modified way. Uh, here's a picture I took a few months ago. Uh, this is Bob Stupak, one of our telescope engineers in the, uh, the bottom of the male telescope, uh, fixing one of the cameras that looks up um, at our fibers. And we were all able to contribute on Zoom and uh, help him work. So we're still able to work on the telescope and we're also still able to continue with our nighttime observations. Uh, we started taking science data again uh, in November of last year. So the highlights, what will DESI do? DESI will measure the effect of dark energy on the expansion of the universe. How will it do it? It will obtain optical spectra for tens of millions of galaxies and quasars, constructing a 3D map spanning the nearby universe to 11 billion light years. Uh, can I see the data? Yes. Uh, we release 100 terabytes per year of data every year for five years. Um, if you would like to learn more, please visit our website at uh, desi.lbl.gov. And thank you to our sponsors and 69 participating institutions. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Claire. That was a really fantastic presentation. Uh, so we've got a couple questions from the audience that we wanted to pose to you. Um, and the first is actually just a quick clarification question. You mentioned at the beginning um, that stars comprised a certain amount of the universe. Was that 5% or was that 0.5%? Uh, <clears throat> let me move back here. Yeah, so um, stars contain 0.5%, but we also have dust um, and heavy elements and other things. So adding up all of the things that we can see, uh, so anything that isn't dark matter is about 5%. Got it, thanks for that clarification. Uh, so the second question I wanna to pose to you is you mentioned there are you know tens of millions of galaxies in the universe. How did the DESI team determine which galaxies to map? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, um, we, you know, we design our instrument and we have so many design trades to make of which, um, which colors of light are we going to look at, um, how long are we going to observe, and those, um, those durations of the observations really limit how, um, how dim of an object that we can see. So we had to put bounds on um, the brightness of galaxies that we were going to observe and um, how old they were, which would mean how you know, the, the color that they were moved into. And then once we have those um, limitations, or but not limitations, but bounds, uh, we actually embarked on an imaging survey um, to acquire precise positions for the number of objects that we could actually observe with our instruments so we can know exactly where they are to be able to follow them up with spectroscopic data. Got it, thanks for that that answer. Um, we've got a ton of questions coming in from the audience. So why don't I invite Dee and Manu back to our virtual stage and ask them to join us and we'll kick off the Q&A session. Um, and why don't I go ahead and start with one of the questions that we just came in. Uh, maybe this is something that either of you could answer. So obviously we can't hear sound in space. So what do astronomers mean by sound waves? Um. Yeah, so, so in this context, when uh, we talk about uh, sound waves in the primordial universe soon after the Big Bang, uh, astronomers really refer to a very similar sort of sound than uh, what you can hear. And the reason is um, we've talked about how the universe is in expansion. And so if you, if you go back in time closer to the Big Bang, the universe is contracts and contracts. And at some point, the universe is basically a dense uh, hot soup of ionized gas, something we call plasma. Um, and temperatures that are similar to um, what the surface of the sun is. So you're in this very hot uh, gas, and this hot gas has sound waves the same way as the air around us uh, has sound waves. Um, and so, of course, if you were in there um, to try to listen to it, you would probably burn your ears, um, something like 3000 Celsius. Uh, but in that respect, it's a very similar sound waves as the ones we can, we can hear. Got it, thanks, Manny. Claire, anything to add? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so let me look at our list of questions. Um, so we got a question about clumpiness, which you both referred to in your talks. Does the ratio of distance between the galaxies change as the clumpiness changes or reduces? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly what we see in the data. You know, we see that the universe is expanding, the distance is stretching, and we also see that the clumpiness is reducing as well. Things are smoothing out. I'll go ahead. So there's non-dark energy also, right? Dark energy exists in the universe, which plays a role in the universe expanding. But does the non-dark energy play a role in that also? Um, yeah, if I, if I can start and, and Claire can uh, add. Um, so basically, one, one key property of gravity uh, is that in some sense it is really relentless. It holds a grudge, it never forgets anything. And so every little bit of energy is counted and pulled on by gravity. And so dark energy is a form of energy. Uh, the mass of any normal objects, our mass is a form of energy. Um, the light uh, that comes out of, of this lamp is a form of energy and gravity pulls on all of these forms of energy. Um, and so Claire showed a sort of energy budget of the universe um, in her pie chart. And you had about 5% uh, of the total energy in the universe in, in the form of normal matter, like uh, you and me. Um, and um, about 27% uh, in the form of this dark matter that we cannot see, and 68% in the form of this uh, dark energy. 
and all of them uh, contribute to the expansion of the universe. Yeah, I think for us, you know, it's so much less interesting to talk about the things that we do know about. We're really kind of driven by the things that we don't know about, which is why we focus so much on dark. Yeah, dark energy, dark. We have a lot, a few questions about how those two are related. Um, so it might make sense to just take a minute and talk about the relationship between dark energy and dark matter. Um, how are they related or how are they different? How are they the same? Those sorts of things. Yeah, so um, dark matter um, is, you know, things that we know are there that we can't see, just how dark energy is energy that we know is there, but we can't directly measure. Um, and um, they're driven by different things. So dark matter, um, we know it's there because when we look at galaxies um, and we see how they rotate, especially the stars on the outside, um, and then we look at the galaxy and see all of, all of the light that we can count and weigh, if that was the only mass that was in that galaxy, the rotation of the stars on the edge would be a lot different. Um, but because of how we see them rotate, we know that there must be more mass in there than we can directly measure. But we don't know what it is, so we call it dark matter. Just like dark energy, we know it's pushing apart. We don't know what it is, but we, so we call it dark. And to advertise, I think a previous uh, edition of this science at Cal uh, Midday Cafe was uh, dedicated to dark matter. And I know the recording is online, so I would invite people who are interested to go watch it. You just did our job for us. Thanks, Manuel. I was going to say that next. So thank you. <laughs> yes, it was a very good Midday Cafe. And please check out our videos. Thank you for the plug, Manu. Uh, maybe uh, I'll ask a colleague of mine, Jocelyn, to put that link in the chat for folks. Um, and let's move on with a couple specific questions. So we got a question about gravitational lensing. So Manu, this one's for you. Um, are the lensing patterns scanned for algorithmically or by human observation or both? Um, so I think historically by both and now more and more um, algorithmically only for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the volume of data is increasing so fast. Uh, if you think of an order of a billion galaxies with something like the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, it becomes uh, really impractical uh, to go look at each of them. And this is where algorithms are very useful. Another reason um, why they are very useful is because um, I showed some images of gravitational lensing where the effect was extremely obvious. Um, you had a galaxy that was stretched into an arc. Uh, actually, a lot of the, um, a lot of the lensing that tells us about dark energy, in some cases, is very subtle. I would call it weak gravitational lensing. And the effect is simply that uh, a galaxy that had some ellipticity now has a, an ellipticity slightly larger by a few percent. And so this is something that you wouldn't, able, you wouldn't be able to notice by eye, um, but um, statistical methods let you measure. Got it. Thanks, Manu. Um, and it looks like we've got a uh, an audience member who's interested in the instrumentation side of things. So the the there's an observation which was how exciting it must be to see uh, an instrument you've helped design sort of come to life, be built and deployed. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience is like? What is it like to see first light? Yeah. Um, so I um, I joined this project straight as straight after I finished my PhD. It's kind of the first project that I worked on. Um, and when I joined the project, it wasn't even called DESI, it was called Big Boss, which was a, um, a, a um, addition onto the BOSS instrument. Um, and so, you know, in those early days, we had so much design space of how many fibers are we gonna have? How are we gonna feed the light? What will the spectrographs look like? And we spent so long doing these trade studies and uh, reviews and making these decisions. Um, and then, you know, I stayed on the project to help build this system. I built the fiber system, um, installed it onto the telescope. And so now seeing the data and um, understanding how those design studies that we took influenced this instrument that is actually really working and delivering the light that we need and working really efficiently, um, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> and I feel really lucky. That's awesome. Thanks, Claire. Um, so I'll ask one more question. Uh, you guys also both mentioned cosmic microwave background. Can you talk a little bit more about what the cosmic microwave background is? 
Um, so the, the cosmic microwave background is uh, basically the first light that we're able to see from after the Big Bang. Uh, back in the, in the days where your TV had an antenna that you uh, would turn to try to uh, get your image straight, uh, about 1% of the, the crap you might see on your screen uh, was our signal, the cosmic microwave background. And um, um, this, is, this is light um, that was present in, in this hot, dense soup at the beginning of the universe right after uh, the Big Bang. And as the universe expanded, uh, that light was able to travel freely um, and get redshifted, which means basically um, move from UV light to optical to infrared and now to microwaves. And so this is light that um, after the Big Bang was at some point as hot as the surface of the sun. And now we observe in the microwave. Um, and this, uh, this image is really the baby picture of the universe. It tells us about the initial conditions of the universe, whereas galaxies tell us about the final conditions today. And in between, you have those 14 billion years of evolution under gravity. And so uh, much of our work is to try to match those initial conditions to the final ones. And if you succeed in doing this, uh, you might have a pretty good model of uh, the history of the universe. And that's how we learn about uh, dark matter, dark energy. Wonderful. And there was a question about CMB S4 and CMB cosmic microwave background S4 you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Right. Um, so there, um, there, there has been a very rich history of measurements of the cosmic microwave background um, ever since its first detection about uh, 50 or 60 years ago. Um, there are currently a number of experiments uh, underway. Um, some of them are called the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, the South Pole Telescope, a Polar Bear, and a number of other that I'm uh, not giving justice to, so apologies. Um, and a number of experiments are currently uh, planned or in construction. Uh, these are uh, the Simons Observatory in the Cosmic Microwave Background Stage 4. Uh, these are extremely large endeavors. Um, to uh, increase by a large factor the number of detectors we have to increase the sensitivity of our measurements of this cosmic microwave background. Um, and so um, these are things that I'm, I'm really excited about. Nice, thank you. So it's been a wild year for all of us, right? I mentioned, you know, even just for anyone who runs events, all of these new virtual events, but how has the year been for astronomers, how has the field changed? Um, you know, how is the year going for you guys? Um, I can start. <laughs> I think from a technical standpoint, we've we've definitely slowed down. There's a lot of instruments that are, you know, definitely going to be delayed um, because of um, how things have happened. Um, but I think in a positive sense, it's really kind of showed how we can be so resilient um, against things. You know, I showed that picture from Zoom of us figuring out how to, um, to work together. We've had um, numerous conferences that have had to go online and we've um, changed the participation there. And um, you know, it also allows people who are at um, universities who may not be as well funded to attend conferences that they couldn't otherwise um, have been to. You know, kind of one of the one of the perks of our job is that the conferences tend to be in you know cool places. The last one was in Hawaii that I went to, um, but not everybody has that budget to be able to afford to do that. So it's really kind of opened up um, the options for people. Right, um, and I should say yeah. So um, um, I, I agree with Claire. A lot of opportunities that perhaps were already present have been highlighted and are now taken advantage of. Um, on the other hand, on the human uh, perspective, some of the members of our community, and typically the more junior ones, uh, undergraduate students, uh, graduate students and postdocs, uh, have found themselves affected in their ability to uh, remain employed or uh, apply for jobs. And I personally have been very privileged that um, my contract still has a few years in it, and so I, I have kept my job, my salary, my roof, uh, unlike some people. Um, so that crisis definitely has affected um, and mostly the most um, junior and people in the most precarious uh, employment situations within the community. Thanks both. It's, it's great to hear that the work has been able to continue during this challenging time. And, you know, we appreciate what, what you're all doing. Um, so we've got a couple more questions about clumpiness. Um, this is a topic I think people are really interested in. So uh, I'll pose them both and maybe we can have you answer, answer the two questions. So first, is the acceleration of expansion known to be roughly constant throughout the universe or is that also clumpy? 
Um, the second question is, um, does the reducing of clumping tell us anything about the properties of dark energy? Is it stronger, for example, when objects are closer to, uh, to other objects? Would you like to start, Claire? No, you please go. Okay. Um, so, right, so I guess there were uh, two questions. The first one was, uh, is this accelerated expansion found to be clumpy or mostly uniform? Um, and I think the answer to this is, uh, on the larger scales, mostly uniform. Um, and so while uh, dark energy may have uh, fluctuations in its own clumpiness, um, so far we're mostly measuring the uniform part of it. Um, and then um, the second part of the question uh, was about, does the effect of dark energy depend on the distances between galaxies or the physical scales we're looking at? Um, and um, the answer in, in some sense, sense is, is yes. Um, so when you look at the, the larger scales in the universe, the largest separations uh, between galaxies, on those larger scales, um, uh, galaxies tend to be less clumped together uh, because their mutual attraction is less. Whereas when you look on, on the smaller scales, uh, this is where a lot of the clustering gets uh, enhanced and the mutual attraction of these galaxies can uh, defeat dark energy. So dark energy is this force that pushes galaxies apart from each other. Uh, but at small enough separation, the mutual gravity is strong enough to overcome it. Got it. Thanks, Manu. Um, so let me pivot uh, back to Claire. A couple questions about the fibers in uh, the DESI instrument. So the first is, how do the fibers convert the incoming light into the, into the graphs that you showed showing the wavelengths? Um, and the second question is, why do the optical fibers need to be moved? Are they sampling just a fraction of the field of the lens? Okay, let me um, start with the fibers then. So, you know, we're, we're taking light from galaxies that's taken billions of years to get here. Um, we don't wanna throw out a single photon. Um, these fibers are hundred microns in diameter. We position them uh, to within five microns in order to capture as much of that light um, as possible. Um, you know, the more light that we capture, the, the less time we have to st spend staring at that object, which allows us to move on to the next field and get more and more objects. So that's all about our efficiency. Um, and then uh, to get the spectra, we, um, the light enters the spectrograph. So I, I showed you a picture of the spectrograph room and talked about the cameras, but on the front end of those cameras is a spectrograph. Um, and just like um, you have a prism which um, spreads light. So we often say um, converting starlight into rainbows. And that's kind of what we're doing with these galaxies. We have this dispersing element um, in front of the cameras that spreads the light out into those different wavelengths in order to be detected by the cameras. And um, DESI uses quite a cool dispersing element. We call it a volume phase holographic um, grading and it's, uh, it's transmissive. So the light goes straight through spreads out into its colors, and then is captured by the camera. It's highly efficient. Very cool. So back to some more general, I know you guys both said that you could talk about astronomy and um, questions that were general, and I really like this question. I read that some objects are, are something like 45 billion light years away. But the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. So how is that even possible? Maybe clear that up for us. I'm not exactly sure about the 45 billion years uh, ago, but what I can say is that if you were in a static universe, um, then the answer would be simple. But because the universe is expanding, um, the the, while well, the speed of light is, is locally constant, uh, distances of objects in, in light years units can be slightly um, counterintuitive. Um, so it's more complicated, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Claire, anything more about that? No, I was trying to think. I actually don't know the number for the, um, yeah. the oldest object to ever have been observed. I, I would like to look that up. Yeah, me too. It's a good question. So. As back to Desi, because people, again, seem to really love the equipment, as do I. Um, it's very fortunate to find a, a detectable uh, a, a telescope. How Sorry, that word was hard for me to say. How difficult was it to find that telescope? Um, so I think 
I read that question before. Um, one of our early trade studies was which telescope we should use. Um, and I think yeah. there were three or four telescopes that were candidates. Um, one of the cool things about um, the male telescope is that it has, um, there's two other telescopes in the world that are pretty much identical. Uh, one of them is in Australia and one of them is in um, Chile, uh, which is where the dark energy survey camera currently is. Um, and so those were our kind of main other contenders for where we could put this. And um, the dark energy camera is still going, which is amazing. Um, and so we decided we could get on the mail first so we could do that. But one option, since the telescopes are identical, is um, maybe at some point in the future, we could move DESI to that telescope in Chile and be able to observe the Southern Hemisphere in addition to the Northern Hemisphere as well. Great, thanks, Claire. Um, so uh, I, I, we got a question about the uh, large underground xenon experiment in South Dakota. Are either of you familiar with that? I have colleagues like, who work on it, but I don't okay. know the details. Right. Well, I was going to say, you know, I, I'm not sure if this was somebody was interested in learning a little bit more about that project and how how it's been uh, making any progress toward uh, to, toward detecting dark matter. But if we don't have, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, so maybe we'll skip that question and we'll get back to that person um, after the after the presentation. So let me move on to the next question. Um, so. I'd be curious to hear both of your thoughts about focusing light as an additional power source for Earth. It's a sort of an out there question, but we'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, that's a good question. There is um, a concept called the Dyson sphere, which is probably very futuristic. Um, but the idea is um, you can use some of the sun's energy to produce, for example, electricity. And that's what we do with solar panels. Um, but you, you, you could, of course, ask, you know, what fraction of the solar energy reaches us on, on Earth? And because the Earth is so uh, small and far away compared to the, the sun, we only receive a small fraction of it. And so there, there have been proposals, these so-called Dyson spheres, that um, an advanced civilization that may want to harvest more of the energy from their stars would surround it by a sphere of effectively solar panels. Got it. Thanks, Manu. Um, well, you know, we are just past the hour, and I thought that was kind of an interesting question to end on. So what I'd like to do is just say thanks again to both Claire and Manu for their fantastic presentations on the topic, and also to our audience who tuned in. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, you know, I, I think we uh, would be curious to hear from you what other topics you might be interested in hearing about. So feel free to drop those ideas into the chat as we're wrapping up. And as we do, I'd uh, just like to say thanks again for joining us. Uh, you can learn more about these events by going to scienceatcal.berkeley.edu. You can learn a little bit more about the research labs doing at ldl.gov. Um, until next time, we will see you then. So I will just say quantum information science on March 18th and water energy nexus on April 15th. But thank you so much from Science Echo, also Claire and Manu. You guys were fabulous. And we look forward to seeing the audience again in next month. Thank you for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.